words of witness. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, goodness, and love, and in Jesus Christ his Son, our Lord and Savior, who for us and our salvation lived and died and rose again and lives evermore, and in the Holy Spirit, who takes the things of Christ and reveals them to us renewing, comforting, and inspiring our souls. We are united in striving to know the will of God as taught in the Holy Scriptures and in our purpose to walk in the ways of the Lord, made known or to be made known to us. Amen. Oath is covenant 
and his blood support me in the whelming flood when all around my soul gives way he then is all my hope and stay on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand when Christ shall come with trumpet sound oh may in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne on Christ the solid rock I stand on other ground sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I wholly Please join me in prayer. Our Father and our God, as we stand at the beginning of our new church year, we confess our need of your presence and your guidance as we face the future. We each have our hopes and expectations for the year that is ahead of us, but you alone know what it holds for us, and only you can give us the strength and wisdom we will need to meet its challenges. So help us humbly to put our hands into your hand and to trust you and to seek your will for our lives during this coming year. In the midst of life's uncertainties in the days ahead, assure us of the certainty of your unchanging love. In the midst of life's inevitable disappointments and heartaches, help us to turn to you for the stability and comfort we will need. In the midst of life's temptations and the pull of our stubborn self-will, help us not us to lose our sight but to have the courage to do what is right in your sight, regardless of the cost. And in the midst of our daily preoccupations and pursuits, open our eyes to the sorrows and injustices of our hurting world, and help us to respond with compassion and sacrifice to those who are friendless and in need. May our constant prayer be that of the ancient psalmist, Teach me, O Lord, to follow your decrees, then I will keep them to the end. We pray for our nation and its leaders during this difficult time, and for all those who are seeking to bring peace and justice to our dangerous and troubled world. We pray especially for your protection on all those who serve in our armed forces, and we thank you for their commitment to defend our freedoms, even at the cost of their own lives. Be with their families also and assure them of your love and concern for them. Bring our divided nation together and give us a greater vision of what you would have us to be. Your word reminds us that blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. And so, our Father, we thank you for the promise and hope of this new year, and we look forward to it with expectancy and faith. This I ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, who by his death and resurrection has given us hope for this world and the world to come. Amen.
rise, keep silent. Oh, rise, keep silent now. We are going to be in 1 Corinthians 12 again, just like we were last week. We began the first half of 1 Corinthians 12. Today we'll finish that second half. So we've been in a series that's been leading up to the next two weeks. Today when we talk about Paul's metaphor for the church, which is a body, and then next week we'll talk about what he says is the greatest calling of all, the call to love. Uh, so remember a few weeks ago we talked about Jesus' baptism and, and how John the Baptist didn't want to baptize him, saying, I should be baptizing, you should be baptizing me, I should not be baptizing you. And Jesus said, that is exactly the point. You, I stand where you ought to be so that you can stand where I am. And that's what baptism is. Baptism is when we reenact Jesus' death and resurrection, that we go down under the waters, we are, we are participating in Jesus' own death, that we might join him coming out of the water in the new life. Um, we talked about how our, our life is not defined by our past sins or even our current sins. Um, we, our identity is found in Jesus. And then we talked about, two weeks ago, we talked about Jesus walking and calling of his first disciples. And we looked at Jesus first saying, what is it that you want? And then offering that in Jesus, all of our truest, deepest desires are found true. Uh, Jesus then saying, come and you will see, the invitation for us to come and follow Jesus. He never promises us to give us, he never promises that we'll have the life that we want. He never promises that things will always go our way. He doesn't even promise that things will be fair in this life. He promises to always be with us. And in the mark of a mature Christian, 
is not the expectation that God will always pave the road in front of us and, and make life easy. No, the promise he gives us is to be with us, that he is behind us redeeming our past. He is with us giving the strength and the faith that we need to face the challenges of each day, and he is ahead of us as he promised to his disciples, preparing a place for us. It is a given, it's a given that our life is hard. It's given that things won't be fair, but the promise of Christianity is despite that, that Jesus will always be with us. In the last week, we looked at the first half of 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul points us to saying, yes, we have different backgrounds. Yes, we have different gifts. Yes, we're all different. But the purpose of that is unity, that these ought not be things that divide us. He, he connects division to idolatry, saying it is idolatry that, that labels those who are in and those who are out, like it makes us have a sense that we are superior to others. He says, no, no, no. In the kingdom of God, we are all one. God gives us the gifts for God's purposes. He's the one that gets all the glory. Um, so, when Jesus renamed Simon, as you remember, to, into Peter, when he said, you were, you were Simon, you're the fisherman, you're the son of John, but now you are Peter. The purpose of the renaming is to tell Peter his place in the world. He says, on this rock I will build my church. In other words, the identity that Jesus gives us is towards a purpose, for the common good. He gives us a gift for his purpose and for the common good. He blesses us, but he blesses us that we might be a blessing to others. He calls us in order to send us. So today we're going to look at Paul's vision for God's people, for the church. And as we open up God's word this morning, let's begin with a word of prayer. Fathers, we open up your word again. I pray that you would give us fresh eyes to see a familiar metaphor to all of us, the church being the body. May you use the scripture to encourage us to pursue health, to join the things you are doing with our brothers and sisters here at First Congregational Church. May we be one, as your son prayed on the early morning hours of his crucifixion. May we be one just as Jesus is one with you. It's in his name we pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians 12, starting at verse 12 and reading through verse 31. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It is not for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would its sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. Then the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body and that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, 
and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. So Paul says, just as a body, though one, one body, has many different parts, so it is with Christ. His emphasis is still on unity, saying a body is still unified, and it's the different parts and the weird shapes of the nose and the ear and the eyes and the hands, and all the different parts of the body are so different, separate, and unique, yet they tie together and work together as part of one body. And that's Paul's vision for us, the church, that though we are different, different gifts, different experiences, different backgrounds, different stories, different histories, different people, we come together in our differences to form something that would not be complete without our presence. So this is obviously a familiar passage. This is a passage that dozens, if not hundreds, of books have been written on. So I just wanted to limit limit myself today to three observations that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12. The first point I want to make is your health matters. The second point I'm going to make is that everyone belongs. And the third is that we are greater than I. So first point, your health matters. Paul uses the metaphor of a body and how the sufferings of one part lead to the whole body suffering. And and I know this is an experience that all of us have had, that we have had an experience of, of having a rock in our shoe, and we, we can't walk until we take the rock out, or a toothache, or, or dust in our eye. You know, if one part of our body suffers, then the whole body can suffer. And if one part is honored, then the whole part of the whole body rejoices. It's, you know, Paul's using a metaphor here, so let's, let's talk plainly about what Paul is talking about. He's saying your health matters to us. If you suffer and are hurting, then that affects us because we are part of the same body. We are all hurt with you. That's simply how bodies work. And it's a good design, by the way. Pain is, pain is good. Pain tells you that there's something wrong, something that requires your attention, something that needs healing. And when part of us, when one of us in the body is in pain, then we work together. We suffer with you. We come alongside you. Um, ignoring pain is foolish. I know this firsthand. About a year and a half ago, I had a, an old crown from when I was a youth that underneath the crown, the, the tooth had rotted away. And uh, one night, I could, I could feel the pain. I knew something was wrong. I was kind of ignoring it. I was kind of hoping it would go away, uh, you know, because, you know, obviously tooth decay miraculously disappears sometimes. And as the, the tooth decayed, uh, the crown broke off and fell out, and my tooth was just exposed. And it was one of the most intense pains I've ever experienced. I immediately woke up in the morning, went and found a dentist that was open first thing uh, in, in downtown Redlands, right across the street from where I am right now. And I remember her looking in there, taking x-rays, writing the referral for me to get a root canal straight away, an emergency root canal. And then she came up to me afterwards and she explained everything. You root canal, uh, here's the x-rays, we're going to get you set up, you're just going to walk across to one of my colleagues uh, across the hall here. And then she put her hand on my shoulder and with her eyes just full of maternal empathy, just said to me, I am so sorry. And I remember that look of empathy. Uh, that if, I'll remember that as long as I'll remember that, that, that toothache. And, and a- after I got my root canal, everything was fixed, the pain was gone, I remember <laughs> praying and talking to God and just saying, you know, I have this tendency of ignoring pain and just hoping it goes away on its own rather than dealing with things directly. And that's what Paul wants us to learn here. He says, deal with your pain. Um, it's when you hurt, we all hurt. Your health matters to all of us. A healthy church is as healthy as its least healthy members. You know, when Lindsay and I, my wife and I, were going through foster care training, we adopted three kids and through the county of San Bernardino, and part of getting licensed to, to do the adoption, we had to go through some parenting classes, and 
And one of the teachers was going up and, and was talking about foster care and how challenging it is. And, and he said, the most important thing you can do as foster parents is have a healthy marriage and be a healthy person. Everything else is going to flow out of your personal health and the health of your marriage. And it makes sense, right? Healthy, a healthy person, a healthy parent, is available to kids, can be patient, or at least has more patience available, won't try to work out their own childhood traumas through parenting or try to hold their fragile marriage together by bringing a kid into it. No, if you want healthy kids, the best way to, to ensure that you're going to raise good healthy kids is to have a healthy marriage and take your, healthy, your own health as a priority. It is the same at church. You know, as a young pastor who at 33 years old, 13 years ago, in fact, this, this, uh, this month is Restoration's 13th year, actually 14th year of, uh, it's our 14th birthday. So I planted it when I was uh, 32, about to turn 33, and I, I for some reason thought I had enough life experiences to, to start a new church. And, and I quickly found in, in my early days of, of planting a church is that a few loud and a, f- and a few unhealthy people um, can bring a church to a screeching halt. You know, just as Clayton Kershaw will be pulled and scratched from the start because he's a blister on his finger, and you think, a blister on his finger, can I take, can I take a day off because I have a blister? Uh, no, it just turns out elite athletes uh, can, are, can't throw a 98-mile-per-hour fastball with accuracy if they have a blister on their finger. Uh, so it is with a church. We cannot move forward as a church with unhealthy people that are unwilling to deal with their, their, their issues and to get the help and healing that they need. So the first point is your health matters. The greatest gift you can give a church is your own healthy presence, to care for your mind, your body, your soul, to take those things seriously. That's the first point Paul raises is when one part hurts, the whole body hurts. So let's, let's pursue healing. Point two is that everyone belongs, that we belong together. There is a part where Paul revisits a theme we talked about last week, that we see, we tend to see diversity as something that divides and separates us. But what Paul is saying is diversity means that we are functioning in a healthy way. If you look around at any given church and you scratch your head and say, what is it that could possibly bring all these people together? They have, they have different political affiliations. They have different, different life experiences. They have different, they're of different ages. They have different cultural heritages. And you think, what is it that could bring this group together? And Paul would smile and say, that's it. That's exactly it. It is Jesus that creates us differently and brings us together. You know, my, my father-in-law once told me, that the parenting is much more about discovering who your kids are than it is about shaping them into something. Children always resist our attempts to force them into some kind of a mold, um, but they experience our love when we delight in the ways that they have been fearfully and wonderfully made. The way to love our kids is not to force them into some mold that they're not designed for but to delight in the person God has made them to be. I, I once heard a mother tell a story about her adolescent son who w- wore this French beret and uh, a ponytail. And you can imagine middle school, 12 years old, going to school every day with a beret and, and a ponytail. He was, he was mocked endlessly, but he, he didn't care. You know, he's just, he was an artist, and uh, he didn't care what people said about him. And so one day, a concerned teacher called her and said, listen, your son, he, he's chosen the most difficult path. Middle school is hard enough. He's making it even harder by, by dressing in such an odd way. Why don't you do him a favor and tell him to not wear that beret anymore and to cut off his ponytail? And so the mom said, all right, you know, I've had this, this same sense as well, and I just, I just want what's best for him. I just want to make the, the road before him as easy as possible. So took him into the kitchen and, and said, today we're going to cut off your ponytail, it's time to say goodbye, um, and um, we're going to lose the beret, and sat him down and took out the scissors and held the ponytail in her, in her hand and, and cut it off. 
and then held it, still held together by a rubber band and showed it to him and said, it's, it's done. And she looked at him and just saw this, this single tear go down his cheek and, and kind of land on his quivering lips. And in that moment, she said, I realized that I had done violence to the person that he is, the person that God had created. And I, and I immediately apologized and said, I'm so sorry that I did that. I just want to make life easy for you. And he said, I know. And they hugged and they cried together. And, and you know, that's, that's what parenting is. Parenting is about discovering who your kids are. And, you know, that's about life. That's what life is too. You know, life is us discovering who we are, who it is that, that God has made us to be. Um, we didn't, he didn't make us to fit into some mold. He made us unique. We are fearfully, we are wonderfully made. He wants us to be us in, in the healthiest version of ourselves. Um, life is about discovering who God made us to be, what our gifts are, where we fit in to our church body. We don't get to decide who we are. It's one of Paul's points, you, you know, the ear doesn't, you know, can want to be an eye. It's not going to make it an eye. It cannot want to be part of the body, but that doesn't mean it gets to leave the body. We are who God has made us to be and where he has placed us. It's our job in the community, in the community of God's people, to discover who we are and, and what he's made us for. And Paul identifies two threats. Threat number one is me saying, I don't have anything to offer. Um, nothing to offer. You know, Paul says it like this, I'm an ear, but I'd want to be, I want to be an eye. Uh, ears are worthless. They're funny shaped. Uh, they don't, people never look at them. Uh, I, I wish to be an eye. I want to see the world the way an eye does, you know. Paul says, what, what good would that do if the whole body were an eye? You know, just big giant eye. You could, you could just roll around and have no eyelashes to protect it and, and no finger to, to, to itch it when, it when it needs it. And, and Paul, Paul is saying, God has made us differently, and that's the point. That's the beauty of God's creation, the diversity. I mean, just look at the first few chapters of, of, of Genesis. And, 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 well, I mean, look at what they point to, the world just brimming with a diversity of life. God loves that diversity. He loves creating something new by bringing us all together as a local church, that, that God has called each of us to use our gifts here for his purposes. Differences are, are never a threat. I, I should not be threatened by anyone's gifts. I should delight in all the ways that God has gifted each and every one of us. Um, they are to be celebrated, including celebrating how God has made each of us differently. So the first threat is this sense, I don't belong, my gifts don't matter, I don't have anything to offer here. The second threat is the other side, when somebody says to you, you don't have anything to offer here, there's no place for you, there's no place for your gifts here. You know, that's the other side that, that Paul identifies. Denominations, traditions, you know, tend to celebrate different gifts at the expense of others. You know, some church, one church might focus on correct doctrine and, and getting these super airtight theological statements that everybody agrees to and, and has no place for the charismatic gifts and the, and the energetic charismatic people in our, in, that are our brothers and sisters. And, and likewise, you know, the charismatic churches, they, you know, they, maybe they struggle with finding place for good doctrine and, and being tighter in, in their study of Scripture. And what Paul is saying here is the problem is that not that some gifts are superior than others. It's that they, we work when they all work together, when we welcome one another in the gifts and what we each bring to it, which is the final point this morning. We is always greater than I and what I mean by that is we as a church can always do more together than we could as a group of individuals. There is no such thing as a lone, solitary Christian. What would, what would the point of that be? What would the point of being a Christian independent and away from community be? Paul urges for unity because what we're called to do is too important for us to be separated by our differences. Um, you know, we need to be committed to one another. Does that mean sometimes we just have this fake peace and agree to disagree and, and never talk about these important issues? No, of course not. Paul, you know, Paul would always openly talk directly about the issues that we face. He just said these cannot divide us because what God has called us to do is simply too important for these petty divisions for us to say, I have nothing to offer, for us not to pursue our own health, for us not to create space for one another. Paul says, what you're called to is too important for these things that have the power and the tendency to divide us. 
So what is it we're called to? What does the body do? What are, what, why did God bring us all together to form a body? What, what's its purpose? Well, that's for next week. For this week, let's consider the three points we heard today. Point one, your health matters. You getting healthy, delivered, free matters to the whole church. We are called to do this together. Secondly, we are called, even though we are different, and even those, those differences tend to divide us into tribes, Paul says, do not give in to that temptation. What, we have, what we're, God has put together, what God has called, what God has gifted, the way this eclectic group of people together has formed a church called First Congregational Church, God has something special for us to do together. And it's the differences and not including each other that can, that can thwart us from achieving that goal because we is always greater than I. And as Jesus prayed for us in the early morning hours of his crucifixion, may we be one as God is one. Let me pray as we conclude this morning's service. Father, as we've been encouraged by your word, may we make unity a priority whether it's in celebrating the gifts and talents of the different people in our church and in their, their worship and their musical abilities to those who are working right now with the cameras and the sound uh, behind the scenes to make sure everything works. Lord, may we be blessed when we create space for one of those gifts. And as we go into our annual meeting after church today, may unity reign there too. Lord, may First Congregational Church, may we be known by our unity and by our love, for you always bind together. Thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.